Nickelodeon Studios. I am freaking out, they are freaking out. About to take a tour of Nickelodeon. Hey Duck Squad, I'm Walt. Today we'll be taking a look at the abandoned Nickelodeon Studios and the history of how it was ultimately abandoned. Check out our Patreon. It's a great way to support the channel. We'll leave a link in the description. Nickelodeon has gone through many changes throughout the years. When we think of Nickelodeon, we think of it as we knew it in the 90s. But in the beginning, it was completely different. Nickelodeon started as C3, an educational channel that was part of Ohio's Cube cable system back in 1977. You've heard about it. You've wondered about it. What is it? Warner Cable's revolutionary 30-channel cable TV system, known as Cube, now operating experimentally in Columbus, Ohio. In 1979, the channel was rebranded as Nickelodeon, the first ever all-children's network on Warner Cable franchises, billing itself as a young people's channel. The channel had many programs dedicated to kids, but the one that stood out during this time was a Canadian show called You Can Do That on Television. This was a sketch comedy show in the spirit of Saturday Night Live that featured teens, preteens, and an iconic element. In this show, slime would rain down on the show's cast in hilarious reoccurring skits. I just don't know. I don't know. But even though this program was very popular, the channel's ratings were awful. Warner was losing more than they were getting, so they decided to spin off Nickelodeon, Music Networks, MTV, and the now defunct radio television station into the newly formed subsidiary MTV Networks. Nickelodeon and MTV had an aggressive rebranding in the hands of producers Fred Seibert and Alan Goodman. They created one of the most iconic TV endings in the history of television for MTV, and they went off to do the same for Nick. They reinvigorated the channel and took it into its golden age. In 1984, Nick was quickly becoming one of the most popular channels. It was gaining viewers and fans with its new cartoons, live shows, and sitcoms. As its popularity grew, the projects became more and more ambitious, and executives knew they had to take the next step. They needed a place to film all of these projects. In the late 80s, Universal and Disney were at war. They both wanted to create movie-based theme parks in Orlando and ultimately turn Orlando into Hollywood East. They were both building parks where guests were going to see how movies were made, but Disney beat Universal by building its first, and Universal, instead of canceling its plans for the park, decided they would take it one step further. Instead of creating their usual studio tour, they would create amazing standalone attractions like Jaws, Confrontation, and Earthquake. But that's not all. Universal made an agreement with Nick in which they would provide the sound stages for Nick so they could have their production space they needed for their new projects, and in return, Universal would open up with a trusted family brand that could rival Disney. This was a great deal for Nick. They took Soundstage 17 for offices, dressing rooms, and makeup rooms, and 18 and 19 for the productions of game, variety, and audience participation shows. Nickelodeon Studios opened alongside Universal Studios Florida on June 7, 1990, with a special live broadcast party hosted by Mark Summers, host of Double Dare. The celebration included an army of kids dressed in 90s neon garb, racing from the Universal Globe to the new Slime Geyser outside the studio for its inaugural eruption of the neon green sludge. The studio was doing great, but in 1991, Nick debuted three iconic cartoons, Rugrats, Doug, and Ren and Stimpy. And this catapulted their brand into superstardom, turning Nickelodeon Studios into a must-go destination in Orlando. And how could it not be? After all, Nick was one of the most popular brands for kids all over in the 90s, and everyone wanted to see how their amazing shows was being created. And of course, Nick's sound stages were not the usual boring-looking production stages. They were painted neon red, blue, and toxic green, paneled with zebra newsprint patterns, and bolt 90s strips and zigzags, and the iconic slime geyser that exploded every 15 minutes, launching green-tinted slime everywhere. 
The studio was not only used for productions, but it also had a 40-minute attraction where guests could experience how real shields were being made. The tour began in the upper levels of Soundstage 18, where guests could find a glassed-in hallway overlooking a real studio set. This set could be from Keenan and Kel, and Clarissa explains it, among others. But the set was not a recreation. This was the actual set where the programs were being made. Guests could even call the official Nick Studios hotline to ask for a production schedule so they could see actors on set, rehearsing, or recording. Next came the post-production workspace, where shows are edited and where special effects are added. After that, guests were taken to the Nick at Night Museum with artifacts from Nickelodeon and its late-night classic TV programming block. And then, the real fun began. Guests were taken into the Gat Kitchen, where they could have a look at how Nickelodeon's famous slime was made and some guests even got to test new recipes for Nick's slime and Gak, including tasting them. But the grand finale and what was considered by many to be the best part of the tour, the Game Lab. In this part of the tour, families could participate in real Double Dare style challenges that were being prototyped so they could be used in the show. Nickelodeon Studios was a fantastic place to experience how these programs were made. Guests could sign up to sit in the audience of live tapings of Figure It Out, Legends of the Hidden Temple, Slime Time Live, and Nickelodeon All-Star Challenge. Nickelodeon continued being a huge success, and ironically, this is what brought the downfall of Nickelodeon Studios. Executives decided to move away from game shows and variety shows and towards Nicktoons. And cartoons like Rocket Power, The Fairly Odd Parents, SpongeBob SquarePants, As Told by Ginger, and Invader Zim all debuted in a three year period between 1999 and 2001. And not only that, but they also shifted towards scripted sitcoms like Drake and Josh, Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, and Zoe 101, which all require closed, quiet sets, not Rocket's game show audiences. So, they opened two new production facilities in Los Angeles by 1998 so they could produce these types of shows. And slowly, Nickelodeon Studios started being abandoned. Apart from the Figure It Out show and some other special events, nothing was being filmed in the studio. By 2001, the tour was reduced from 40 minutes that it used to last to just 10 minutes. And in 2004, the studio was repainted with a new look, which made people think that somehow it would be revived. But the opposite was about to happen. In that same year, Nickelodeon Studios filmed its last production, Nickelodeon Splat, live from March 7, 2004 to August 17, 2004. And in April of 2005, the last tour took place, and Nickelodeon Studios was closed forever. The logo, fountain, and signs were removed, a time capsule that was buried back in 1992 and contained lots of 90s objects like the original 1992 Game Boy, a pair of Reebok pump sneakers, a pair of rollerblades, a Barbie, VHS copies of Home Alone and Back to the Future, and lots of other stuff was relocated to Orlando's Nickelodeon Suites Resort until 2016 when it was taken to Nickelodeon Animation Studios in Burbank, California and is set to be open in 2042. Stage 18 was transformed into the Sharp Arc Wheels Theater, which opened on June 6, 2007, featuring the Blue Man Group. Stage 19 was utterly abandoned, along with the offices, equipment, and other remnants of what used to be Nick Studios. In 2016, this was all renovated and became a Blue Man Group VIP experience. Much of the rest of the old Nickelodeon Studios facility is inhabited by Fox Sports Florida and its television production and administrative space. Soundstage 19 is used as a parade float storage for the park next door. Sadly, all the Double Dare 2000, Clarissa Explains It All, Good Burger, Eureka's Castle, the Mystery Files of Shelby Wu, and Legends of the Hidden Temple sets were completely demolished and destroyed. It is sad to think that such a fantastic part of the 90s and many people's childhood has ended up the way it did. What do you think? Would you like to see Nick Studios nowadays, or do you think it's ran its course? Let us know in the comments. Thankfully, there are lots of other attractions at Universal Parks we can still visit when they reopen soon. So check them out and start planning your next vacation. Our friends at Pixie Vacations will help you plan your perfect vacation to Universal Studios Hollywood, Universal Studios Orlando, or Universal's Islands of Adventure, specifically tailored to your vacation style and budget. And working with a Pixie is completely free. So, talk with them to make the best out of your next theme park vacation.